mule deer populations here and pretty much throughout their range in the western United States have declined anywhere from 50% to possibly 70% in the last 20 to 30 years. And the exact reasons are, are not completely clear, but there's a lot of factors that have been related to that decline. The pinion juniper has been encroaching over time. This is unnatural to have this extent of these pinion juniper forest. You know, we suppressed fire over long periods of time. That's created this, this primarily timber dominated area. And I think historically it was more patchy. We just basically try to remove the overstory because it looked like this before it was treated and now it's been opened up and what we've benefited from from that treatment is we get a lot of this new growth coming in these lighter colored stems like here and here that's all late winter deer forage without the habitat treatments we have much less of this type of shrub community in this heavily timbered area Ultimately, we're attempting to evaluate whether or not these habitat improvements will actually provide uh, a benefit to mule deer. This is a GPS collar. Um, it collects locations. Uh, we get five locations a day from this collar, and then it's programmed to release April of the following year. So it'll be out for 16 months. The most efficient way to, to capture deer in order to collar them and, and get the information that we need is to use helicopter net gunning. So we hire a helicopter crew, so they'll have a net gun, and they'll fly over these deer and shoot the net over the deer. The most challenging thing is try not to shoot the helicopter. After that, it's trying to figure out the holes in the brush where you can get the net in where the deer won't roll out of the net or the net get hung on it. And net gunning it in a place where the deer won't get hurt. Once we catch the deer, we actually give them a sedative to kind of relax them and minimize that stress. We probably handle them maybe 30 minutes at the most. Once they leave and return to where they came from, they're doing the same things they were doing prior to when we caught them. And we know that because we have GPS collars on those deer. It, it disturbs them a bit for one to two days and then after that they, they're fine. We've done five years of pre-treatment monitoring before we've changed anything, basically monitoring existing conditions. And then two years ago, we completed habitat improvement projects in two of those areas. And then we're gonna evaluate how the deer respond to those habitat improvements over the next six years. How they use the area and how they use those sites and also how their condition improves. 4.5 BCS. And ultimately how that may uh, translate into their reproductive success. 
The Piance Basin is our largest migratory deer herd in the state, and it also contains one of the largest natural gas reserves in the country. We're learning a lot about how deer interact with energy development activity, which activities are more invasive than others. If deer actually use the habitat treatments in the developed landscape, that's our best way to go, because then we can benefit those deer right there, maintain their use of those landscapes, and enhance their condition. He might come straight into you over there. Like that. Most folks' definition of wilderness is areas that basically are in a pristine, natural setting without human influence. I'm not sure that totally exists. And I think there's a place for wilderness. I, I think it's important to protect you know, these, these natural areas and keep them as natural as possible. But there's a place for development too. So how can energy development be implemented in a way that's least detrimental to wildlife and, and wildlife habitats?